I couldn't find the last thing to get that 100%. So technically, I never finished. It was inside of you all that along. game. Oh, that's sweet. <laughs> now I feel. Now I feel. The complete. crystal was walking away from the game. Yeah, that's what it was. <laughs> Getting um, going outside. This week on Backward Compatible. Jim, Doc, and Chris are joined by Nick Kruger to talk about the differences between finishing and beating a game. Plus, impressions of the Heat Signature Alpha, the Exploding Kittens Mobile Beta, and Infamous Second Son. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 62 of the BackwardCompatible.com podcast, Games and New Media with a Splash of Academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Howdy, y'all. <laughs> Coming straight to you from Texas. That's Jimbo. No, I don't, I don't know why I did that, but let's just keep going. I think it'd probably be that third cup of coffee. Yeah, I think so. I think so. <laughs> and this is Doc. Hey, everybody. And today we're rejoined by an old guest of ours, Nick Kruger, who is also my brother and also the guy who does all our music. Hello, everyone. And today our meaty topic of discussion is going to be something that Doc actually came up with. Uh, the idea of... You say that like it's a shock that I came <laughs> up with something. <laughs> he actually came up with something. Wow, pulling his weight wow. finally. <laughs> no, the guy with the PhD time. is contributing to society <laughs> in some way. <laughs> um, They're just going back to school again and again and again. <laughs> Sorry, the snark is strong with this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, the topic is going to be the concept of finishing versus beating games. And to a degree, it ties in with our talk we had last week about retro games and some of the misconceptions. Um, but uh, the idea being here that we have games nowadays that you tend to finish more so than beat because games back in the day that didn't have as many autosaves or uh, some of the conventions that we kind of have today required you to really master the systems in order to clear them. Uh, so we're going to be talking about some of the implications of that and some of the ways that it's done now versus then, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but first, we're going to go and jump into our opening segments, including the button mosh. Get ready for the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. I was uh, accepted into the Heat Signature Alpha, uh, Heat Signature is a game developed by Tom Francis, who created Gunpoint, which is the uh, uh, side-scrolling stealth platforming game with puzzles, which is pretty cool. Um, Heat Signature is a open-world, sort of procedurally generated stealth game. Um, in space. In space. Yes, if you want to find out more about it, the, the URL is actually spaceships.cool, which I found interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Dot cool. Dot, Dot cool. cool. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's it's a uh, top-down game where you fly in a spaceship and you're able... It's like a very small pod. It's just like a one-man spaceship. And you uh, fly into enemy ships and sneak aboard and carry out missions like assassinating somebody or uh, kidnapping somebody or... You know, doing all hosts of nice things to people. Do you manage a crew, or are you just like a one-man You're just ship? a one-man person. So you go in, and all you have is like a gun or a wrench or something like that. Wait, a gun or a wrench? I'm going to pick the gun. Well, yeah. You can take the wrench. Well, you start out with just a wrench, oh. but you can buy... Yeah, I'll get to that. Um, but yeah, basically, you, you sneak aboard, and uh, what's interesting is that everything in the game uh, is just one big level, essentially. Um, so when you go into your ship you're just inside your ship and you can fly it around, but then as soon as you dock, you just walk from your ship to the enemy ship, and everything is procedurally generated, so each ship, each enemy ship is like its own uh, mini-level slash puzzle hmm. sort of thing. And um, as of right now, since they're in early planning stages, uh, there's not really any long-term goal other than... Uh, so, it, if you zoom out at the galaxy, you see a sort of constellation-looking thing, which is basically a network of uh, space stations connected by trade routes. So your your goal is to um, take over space stations by disconnecting trade routes, and you do that by hijacking enemy ships. So you sneak aboard, you take out the captain, you you know make sure not to get killed, 
and you mm -hmm. take their ship and you can destroy it or use it to do whatever you want. And for listeners, when uh, Nick said take out the captain, he actually did a little gesture like he's beating the captain over the back of the head with a wrench. <laughs> yes. So I can tell that's, what weapon he prefers. That's known yeah. as the Kirk. I, I like the wrench because the guns are loud and people will detect you, mm -hmm. which is interesting because mm -hmm. there's each gun has a radius of uh, how far away it will, you know, it, there's like a little circle around you. If you shoot a gun, people will hear mm -hmm. you and try and take you out. But yeah, um, it's it's still in alpha stages and it's it's at the moment it's running into the issue that a lot of games have where it'll be... Um, you know, a lot of content because it's procedurally generated, but it doesn't really hold your interest for very long. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it seems... Not, what was the term for that? Um, it's not managed content. Is that the correct term that I'm looking for? Curated? Curated content. There you go. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's a lot of it's a lot of content, but it's, it's a lot of emptiness, too. But. Yeah, it's very empty feeling at the moment. And that <laughs> seems to be what the developer is actually trying to fix right now. Because if you uh, if you look at the the questions he's asking about in the forms for feedback that you give as an alpha user, uh, he seems to be really interested in uh, giving more long term goals to the players, hmm. which is uh, interesting because he seems like he wants to wants it to have sort of a narrative and make it so your your player can do a lot of different things in the in the randomly generated galaxy. Hmm. And this this is all single player though. Right? Yes, it is all okay. single player. So that could I mean that could add something if it was a multiplayer game. I mean, I guess. And you're like, and because you're in this procedurally generated. Because one of the things that I've thought of with some pe people that make these very large procedurally, procedurally generated spaces for one person to play in, it feels kind of like a waste to me. Mm. Well, what's interesting is that actually, uh, whenever you your character dies, um, you spawn in the same galaxy, but as a different character. So you can actually change your goal entirely when you, whenever you die. So you could, if you wanted to, expand your own. Uh, one, you could help one faction expand their hmm. borders, but if you die, you could help another faction. So it's like this this ongoing sort of thing. And uh, you could also just generate a new galaxy to start in. So there's lots of potential content there. So I think whenever he adds more long-term goals to the game, it'll be interesting to see um, the sort of narratives that take place in each character's life in each and the story of each galaxy so to speak hmm, cool so if if people want to play this game you said the what's the it's a spaceship dot cool spaceships dot cool spaceships plural yes okay. and you could also find it um at heat sig i believe on twitter so yeah hmm, cool i like tom francis i think he's an interesting designer mm -hmm. yes he's the guy who back in 2012 had the standing room only very very small uh presentation called how to explain your game to an a-hole. Yeah. <laughs> oh, right, yes. Yeah. I've heard of this. Yeah. I do know this guy, then. Yeah, yeah you do. All oh, right, cool. Yeah, and, and I got into yeah. kind of knowing him back when I was teaching game studies mm -hmm. because he was a really interesting guy to follow and, mm -hmm. and used him as an example. Very so. open development, too. He's got a YouTube channels where he uh, yeah, yeah. talks about what he does. So, In my understanding, Nick, is that you actually uh, pitched some music to him back in the early days. Is yeah, right? he did a contest early on with uh, Gunpoint where... Uh, he was basically taking open submissions for music composition and for art. Mm -hmm. uh, he actually did that with Heat Signature again, but I didn't. I didn't do an entry for this. Uh. But um, uh, I I did a music pitch for that, and it actually it, he seemed to like it. It's just other people got uh, you know the soundtrack was much better than what I did at the time, especially. So I would have preferred that they would. Uh, I'm glad the the music turned out the way it did, honestly, for that game. The, the voice of, of, of youthful regret <laughs> and experience. Oh, or I mean, I have more experience now, so maybe That's next time. That's what I mean. Yeah, <laughs> maybe next time. Totally. This is the Gaming Meta. News and commentary about the games industry and gamer culture. I'll start off here. I've been following a game recently. There's been a little bit of news about uh, known as Tokyo Mirage Sessions. This is a game that in Japan was released as, I believe, just uh, Shin Megami Tensai X or Cross, Cross. Fire Emblem, um, depending on how you say it, <laughs> or, or multiplied by. Are you I just saying know. words right now? No, I'm just saying <laughs> Whatever it is you're saying. I, I, I think, I'm that's hearing, that's I'm hearing why lots they change. Video games in, in general, in Japanese games, when you have the X, it's supposed to be It's cross. supposed to be Cross, yeah. but um, I'm just going to say multiplication. <laughs> Times yes. Fire Emblem. Times Fire Emblem. <laughs> yes. No, uh, but actually it's it's sort of this interesting concept that they do for uh, in Japan with both um, anime and video games, something that we typically don't get over here. They usually don't localize that for us. So it's very interesting that they're going to bring this game to the U.S. It's on the Wii U. It's mm -hmm. already been out in Japan since December. 
Um, but it's coming to America. They're giving it another name, it's a snazzy name, Tokyo Mirage, Se- Mirage <laughs> Sessions. Um, and uh, the news that just came out, uh, the game itself is not going to be localized by uh, Treehouse, which is the Nintendo of America localizers who have hmm. been hmm. Um, lambasted, I should say, recently <laughs> for some of their um, their work replacing actual dialogue with memes in the latest Fire Emblem. Oh. So they're not going to be involved let's, in this Let's not open that wound again. I'm just, I'm just <laughs> mentioning I'm giving them some background. Too soon, Jim. Uh, <laughs> right, I'm just giving them some background. But uh, it's actually going to be localized by Atlas, and the game is not going to be dubbed either. It's actually going to be completely Japanese oh. voiceover. Oh, interesting. interesting. Um, with subtitles, mainly because uh, the game itself takes place in modern-day Japan, very strong cultural influences. So it really makes more sense to go ahead and just leave it in Japanese. So why do they call it Tokyo Mirage Sessions is what I'm asking. Well, that's what I was looking up specifically. Because it sounds like you're like playing in a jazz club in, in Japan. It somewhere. does, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so apparently um, there are these beings known as mirages okay. that have sort of like come from an alternate dimension mm-hmm. um, to attack Tokyo and they're harvesting enemy, um, I'm sorry, they're harvesting energy ah. um, from humans. So that's, I'm assuming why they're in Tokyo there's mirages, and then I guess sessions, I don't know. Uh, you're playing the game in, like, battles or sessions or something, and I'm Maybe. not sure. Yeah. Um, but it's an interesting concept. The game itself just seems so different from what we're used to getting that I think it's 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 excited me. I'm, mm. I'm interested in it. Yeah, it's in one it. I've been looking forward to for a while. Yeah, yeah. so it, it, it seems like a, the sort of game that, that is, um, as a role-playing game, something that at least would be different. Um, and that's coming in June. Mm-hmm. So. Um, Chris, you had some news as well, I think. Yeah, so this is something I was going to mention a little while back. Um, coming up on, I think, May 3rd, I might be getting my dates wrong, um, Battleborn's uh, going to be launching, um, which is kind of the first game that was announced that's kind of gotten the term hero shooter attached to it, kind of a MOBA-like first-person shooter game. Um, and and Smite was sort of like that too, wasn't it? Uh, I mean, not less less shooter, but hmm. it was it was an action MOBA right. kind of concept. Yeah, kind of. That's like, a Gearbox game, right? Uh, Battleborn is Battleborn, yes, yeah. Gearbox, yeah, uh, which is of course a local company. So we we love us some Gearbox. Yes, um, but uh, Overwatch from Blizzard is actually going to be launching uh, their beta. I think the same day. Um, Blizzard is not local, so we hate them. <laughs> no, yeah, we don't. Uh, we don't base games uh, <laughs> on, on their quality, but on their proximity. Yes, yes exactly. Yes. <laughs> so many, uh, so many great games have come out now. I'm just surprised. <laughs> and so many I'm surprised Blizzard's out. actually releasing a video game. So it's, <laughs> I'm floored. They do uh, that still? Yeah, apparently. Wow. wow. I thought they just broke their old ones. <laughs> but what's interesting about this whole thing <laughs> is that um, they still do that too. Don't worry. <laughs> okay, good. What's interesting about this whole thing though is that uh, Overwatch has also been sort of dubbed a hero shooter. Now, um, a lot of people have actually come out who have played both games and who have said they're very different in a lot of ways. Yes, they are first-person shooters, and yes, they have some some of the trappings of MOBAs, but Overwatch has been generally considered by a lot of people to be a simpler, faster, um, more streamlined experience than Battleborn, which has a lot more depth, a lot more long-term play. It has a single-player cam- uh, single, single campaign, whereas Overwatch doesn't. Um, and what's interesting to me, though, is that a lot of people are comparing Battleborn to Overwatch as, as if Overwatch came first, and it's probably just because it's Blizzard, <laughs> um, because Battleborn was actually announced well before Overwatch was. Yeah. Um, and I guess Paragon's another one now, too, that people are kind of likening to a, uh, a hero shooter. Um, Par- I, didn't even know, I have not heard of Paragon. Yeah, it's, it's something that's been kind of cropping up in web advertisements, but nobody's really paying attention to, hmm. or at least I haven't been. So um, it's another one. It's another mm-hmm. hero shooter. Yeah, so they're all um, kind of coming out around the same time, which is interesting. Um, so a lot of people who have played both say they're both good, they're both different, you know, so it's not like you're trying to compare one directly to the other. Um, but it's interesting, though, that there's this sense of competition that has emerged just because gamers see similarities and want to compare them. And uh, it was actually interesting because Randy Pitchford, the CEO slash president of Gearbox, um, local guy, obviously, uh, came out on Twitter as soon as he heard the news that Blizzard was planning to launch their beta on the same day as their release, um, you know, kind of acknowledging that, like, hey, look, some competition, <laughs> you know. And um, it's just funny how the, the tables kind of get flipped just because it's Blizzard. You know, they're the, the big guys, and so they can sort of come second and be considered first. Um, but apparently uh, Gearbox is kind of embracing the competition, and so it'll be uh, interesting to see how the uh, the public perception plays out with these two games. Personally, I think I'd be interested in trying both. I'm probably more interested in Battleborn because it looks like it has more of the gameplay style that I'd personally be into. I like um, Borderlands. Yeah. And I like single-player campaigns especially. Mm-hmm. So uh, it'd be interesting to see how those games turn out, but just thought that was an interesting little uh, phenomenon to observe. 
This is the Mobile Minute, where we share something new or noteworthy about those computers we keep in our pants. You know, I also had a chance to uh, do a beta, and it was actually for the Exploding Kittens mobile game it sounds beta. Sounds violent. It, it does. <laughs> and disgusting. Um, and I'd just like to be clear from the beginning that um, backward-compatible.com does not endorse the exploding of kittens. Was this <laughs> was this produced by Bob Barker? You know, I don't think so. Sorry, this is that was an old joke. No yes, it was. Get, no one's going to get that. No Have get. your digital pets spayed in either. Um, okay, the, the, so the illustrations though suggest that the kittens are the ones who are trying to make things explode. Um, yeah, well, that's oh, actually like the, the kittens are doing the yeah. exploding. They you know, if you want to get meta them. about this, <laughs> it, it's the idea that kittens will mess up whatever it is you're trying to do. Uh, so if you really think about that, then that means that you have something near you which is set to explode. You yes. are, for example, a terrorist. Uh, so it seems that the uh, the exploding that is happening is actually a good thing because it's foiling nefarious plans. But I don't want to get meta, so we're not going to talk about that. I'm, not, I'm just not a big fan of violence and explosions in general. <laughs> I'll kill you for saying that. See what I did there? Yeah. Isn't that, that yeah, good? Funny. No. Yeah. no one's Game, laughing. Gamers are so violent. Yeah, okay. That's an old joke. It, it is. It's, it's <laughs> fantastic. Um, but anyway, I had some observations while playing. Uh, I've had a chance to log a couple of hours, and it, it was kind of nice. Um, first thing I want to say is that I actually prefer playing it in this mode to playing it in analog hmm. um, as the actual card game. Um, now... Keeping in mind that it is still Exploding Kittens, and I'm not a huge fan of the game or the mechanic itself, because it's basically just Russian roulette with cats. Uh, I'm also not a fan of the oatmeal, so that really doesn't appeal to me any. Mm. Um, I made some observations, and and namely, it's that um, they've done a really good job with the avatars and the voices that you have in the game. So, like, for example, I, um, as part of this, was able to download some of the new avatars, and I went for the bear, the party bear, and he sounds like Nixon for some reason. <laughs> um, but Wait, isn't it supposed to be about cats, though? Well, yeah, but the, the other party bear is other, you know. Anyway, it, it brings in other stuff. And Nixon knew how to party, so that makes sense. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly right. Um, and Watergate was legendary. <laughs> <laughs> and so whenever you do Some things... Some massive kegger. <laughs> playing Russian roulette. It, it was cats. basically Woodstock, but political. <laughs> <laughs> When you do things like um, emote, which this is an emote, emote system rather than a chat system, which I call that a win. Yeah. Uh, in any mobile space game where you're um, competing against strangers, I think that's a good Especially idea. Especially strangers under the age of like 15. Uh, absolutely. Can you squelch? Um, you can. There is a squelch function. Good. Um, and you can squelch individuals, too, since you're playing in a multiplayer, mm. era, which is kind of cool. I, I like that. Do we have children listening? Is this a kid show? Talking about squelching in here. What is squelching? <laughs> I don't know, but it sounds dirty. It's <laughs> Violent and or dirty. Uh, that would be to uh, hit a button which causes someone not to be able to speak, Jim. Oh, that was not even close. No, you, 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 no. Don't, you don't have a squelch button or okay. else we would use it. Um, <laughs> it's got squelched. <laughs> to <laughs> to somehow try to bring this back to a semblance of normalcy, another good thing that exists is uh, the timer. The the actual timer in the game. It's very short, actually, just a couple of seconds. It keeps things fast-paced, which it's supposed to be. It's mm-hmm. Russian roulette. And not only is there a timer, but there's also this really cool... Uh, what would you call it, Chris? Would you call it like a, a, a percentage meter or a... It's, a... it's a probability gauge, a probability meter, letting yeah. you know... On your next draw, here's your percent chance of drawing an exploding kitten card. So, in simplest terms, if there's only one card left, as often happens, mm. and you know that it's the, the kitten... It's going to be a hundred percent chance, but if there are three cards in the deck and one of them is a kitten, then there's a thirty-three percent chance, and so it tells you that very, very obviously, which is a great fix for the digital spaces problem of not showing you how big the deck is, mm-hmm. and also As not this, having people talking around the table about like, oh, I bet it's coming up. Right, exactly. Right. The air of tension. So yeah. you know, um, the the basic play is pretty net heavy. It's play with friends, play with strangers. But I was surprised there wasn't a pass and play option. Maybe that's coming. Um, but if I wanted to just pull it up and pass it around the table, I can't do that. And I think that would be kind of fun. It would actually mm-hmm. have the, the pass the, the, the gun kind of <laughs> well, if idea. you're going to be at a table, don't, don't you just want to play the card game, though? Well, that's a good point. Um, but, you know, traveling ask, in the car, they... there's, there's reasons to do it. it Being it, in the plane, in the train, in the whatever. Would you say that uh, playing the mobile version feels faster or better overall? Well, I think so. Um and and there's one simple reason why. Really, the game. I'm you said that. But well, I know. Hmm. But in this in this version, as with any digital version, the game won't cheat. 
and the players oh, yeah. can't cheat. And you're absolutely governed by the real rules. Mm -hmm. You don't have to think about them. One of the most complicated rules that I find a lot of people don't get in Exploding Kittens is that whenever you pass, you still have to continue with your turn if you have more than one turn inflicted upon you. However, mm. I mean, it only eliminates one turn. Right. However, if you play a slap card, which is, of course, how that mechanic happens in the first place, your remaining turns actually go to the other player. And so I've seen three, four, five, six turns be passed to someone when there's only one card left in the deck and they have three in their hand. Oh, wow. They're going to lose. Yeah. It's, a, it's actually a really brilliant strategy if you can make that come into your favor. So it turns out the distribution of the cards that these guys put into the deck was actually really well thought out. Shocking. And I didn't get that experience because whenever I first played it, that rule was played wrong. Hmm. So for someone who wants to learn how to play the card game, if they even have the card game or whatever, I recommend that you get the app and play it a couple of times hmm. uh, when it does finally come out because it's going to teach you how to play the game correctly. But if you learn how to play the game with the app, do you think the card game could still be better? I think it could still be better. But it, for me personally, um, I actually like it because the, the group that we regularly play with are not casual card gamers, if mm -hmm. you will. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I think that there's a casual element to this that is very, very strong in the digital space. Mm -hmm. So I'll close out Exploding Kittens Digital Edition by saying this. I think there's a lot of potential for the game. If in no other thing than the ability to um, bring your own personal cards or a collection of cards to the table. I'm not talking Hearthstone level here, but there is um, there are some in-app purchases, and one of them is to expand your deck. I don't fully understand how it is they're doing this, whether there's a room A and a room B, and those who've purchased it are playing with a different deck, uh, or those who aren't, aren't, or if you bring in the deck you've chosen, and mm. it gets mixed in. Um, but Chris, uh, when he played it a little earlier today, pointed out something really, really important, and this applies to all the games like this, and it is, you can shuffle your cards and my cards together, and because of the nature of the digital space, when the game is done, I get all my cards back and I don't have to worry. Mm -hmm. So there's a core mechanic there that really needs to be mined. This is Back Talk, where someone shares their thoughts on a previous discussion they missed. A lot of the points you guys made about uh, retro games, especially in terms of the art style, uh, that applies so much to music in retro games or retro-like games made by indie developers nowadays. I like the term neo-retro. Neo Copyright retro. Doc 2012. <laughs> Whoa, neo-retro. Wow. Dude, that's, that's a good yeah. name. Actually, no, it was 2006. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, but yeah, so in a lot of retro games nowadays, uh, they like to have chiptune music uh, because that just fits the aesthetic of ret retro mm -hmm. stuff. Um, but that's another example of uh, them being lazy with art sometimes because uh, what's what what was the defining sound of chip tune music on the NES? Was... Wait, are you saying musicians are artists? I thought this was going to be quick. <laughs> He's giving me a dirty, dirty look now, and I totally deserve it because I'm just trolling. No, you mean the you mean they had those? Uh, what was it? Was it three or four four sound channels for the NES? Right? Or was it three? Uh, it's like I mean, the square the the triangle. I'm trying to remember. There were two pulse channels, a triangle channel, and a noise channel, okay. and a okay. sample channel, which was only sometimes used. Um, but that, I mean, aside from that, the the point is, when people make chip tune music or retro music or whatever, they're not really trying to make it. Uh, they're not trying to be authentic with it, which I think it, it bothers me to mm -hmm. some extent, because the the defining sound was based on the limitations that they had with the hardware back then, and that's why it sounds so interesting. Because they really had to, the composer for the games actually really had to put a lot of effort into um, writing good music aside Thank from you. aside from what happened or, or what like limitations they have with the hardware or whatever. Mm. Um, but nowadays, a lot of people are just trying to make chip tune music because they feel like they have to for a uh, retro style game, and they uh, they didn't really. Oftentimes, they they don't even. Uh, make it sound anything like an actual retro console or make it sound retro in in, in its stylistic choices either. Um, this is often referred to in the chiptune community as fake bit, <laughs> um, where they'll get a very, really, like... So a lot of really serious chiptune producers either like to actually get the real sound chip from a console and use that to write their music, yeah. 
or they'll um, get emulators and just like know which rules they have to follow using those emulators. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of producers, especially, and I've seen this a lot in indie games, is they'll just like they'll get a really like a really simple sounding synthesizer and pass it off as chiptune, and uh, it sounds bad ninety nine percent of the time. I mean, it, it couldn't be done well, but it's. It, it's not what they're trying to go for, and it just ends up falling flat for me. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you want to call out one particular game that you're like, oh, I can't. I actually, bad. I would. I definitely oh. would, but I can't think of any at the moment, mostly because they're not memorable. Ooh, <laughs> that's harsh. <laughs> that is harsh. Okay. And now, this week's meaty topic of discussion. Here's my story. Um, uh, I actually beat a game I've been working off and on to play and beat uh, for a while now, and that is Second Son, which is really um, infamous three, mm -hmm. technically. Um, what's funny is I never really finished um, or beat. We, we will use those words interchangeably until we define them. <laughs> um, either one of the first ones, I just didn't find them that compelling, but I really liked Second Son. I thought it was mm -hmm. cool that it was set in actual Seattle. Um, and then the main character that you play, he's kind of a punk at first, um, but his conduit power, his superpower, if you will, bioterrorist, if you prefer that uh, that term in the in-game <laughs> lore, um, is to actually touch other conduits and take their powers uh, semi-permanently. Sort of like Rogue from, mm -hmm. you know, the, the comic books or whatever. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I really enjoyed the, the gameplay, and it was open world, and it had all these things going for it, and you could go the karma system, which was completely binary. You do good stuff, you get good karma, it unlocks good superpowers. You do bad stuff, it's bad karma, it's bad superpowers. Either way, you're still tagging stuff, which is not necessarily good or bad, um, but you can uh, do the, the happy thought version of the spray paint, or the... Oh, yeah, I was uh, going to ask you. Uh, you say, no, literally you tagging. tagging. Okay, I just yeah, wanted to make sure. No, that, that's, and that's the culture that he's coming from, is... Is, is yo, I'm a I'm a punk dude, and mm. I'm, I'm, I skateboards and 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 spray paint man, you know mm. that kind of thing. Um, he played a lot of Jet Set Radio when he was growing up. Yeah, he and, totally. And did. now he's just really into the culture. Uh, the the plot is actually kind of interesting because you've got this this conduit who's uh, the head of the DUP, which is the. Um, or as I like to call them, the dup. The dup. I call them the dupe. <laughs> oh, you've yeah. been duped. Uh, you've been duped exactly. Uh, but but she's actually. Uh, out to to capture them all, and there's a really interesting backstory behind all that. She feels like an authentic and real character, and she has concrete. Powers. Has she been doing it since she was ten? No, she got to choose from three starter. Oh, and, I see what she yeah. did. There. And, uh, <laughs> no, she wants to be the very best. Yeah, but, but, like no but his whole was. his whole town, which is actually and when you say concrete power for people that haven't played, you don't mean her power is like concrete from metaphysical. You mean literally she has she was the actually a private contractor for a right. While. Yeah, no. she has, literally has the powers of concrete. She has the well, and and within the infamous. Universe, this makes sense because okay. the first one was the power of electricity, mm -hmm. uh, and then then um, in this game you can have smoke powers. That's your first one. Okay. And from that you can uh, evolve up, if you will, to by touching another one who has uh, neon powers, mm -hmm. and those are really cool because you move fast around the city. Mm -hmm. And that's when the whole neon game shifts powers. from day to night. Mm -hmm. Which is really cool Neat. because you've just gotten to the point where you're like, yeah, okay, whatever, I get this game, is, is, and is, then is the whole thing changes. Okay, neon power. I haven't played this. Neon mm -hmm. power sounds a little bit ridiculous. Is it supposed to be over the top crazy, or is it supposed to be like it's, serious? It's pretty seriously delivered, but it is it is a little bit over the top and cartoon ish. Okay, um, but it's well done. The drama is well done. So, um, so they're taking themselves seriously when they, they say are neon taking powers. themselves. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, and, and you drain. Um, neon from signs around the town. Okay. Um, who knew there was so much neon in Seattle? But apparently there is. Um, <laughs> That's what I'm and, and then you have the power to move around fast and shoot lightning and, and neon out of your I don't know nose or something. Um, and then the the third one that you finally get is video powers. And this kid who has this conduit who has those is a video game nerd and he's kind of a geek. And so they go there with that. And and you actually enter the video game world and you fight this big demon in this digital space that sort of thing. And then the last one you get, of course, is the concrete powers. The whole reason you're doing all of this is so that you can take on the bad guy who's not really a bad guy. And um, you touch. So you want to touch her to get her concrete powers, so that you can go back home and heal all the people that she has. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> um, phrasing. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. The point is this: uh, the very last level, and, and this is a spoiler. Um, you 
I'm going to use that line, by the way. You confront her. <laughs> don't go for it. Just, go. Uh, just be sure to attribute. Girl, I want to touch you and steal your concrete power. <laughs> <laughs> Bad touch. Bad touch. <laughs> no. No. Um, <laughs> when you have the final battle, uh, there's, there's three parts to the battle, really. And before the very last final, final battle... Uh, you actually do beat her enough to touch her and take her powers, and uh, Doc, what you're are you doing to us over here? I know. And what you're doing <laughs> is you're evolving your concrete powers during the last battle. Wait, I, I never was it. Did you clarify? Is it actually power over concrete? Yeah, it's uh, yeah, the power to create there, yeah. concrete. This is so stupid, and I love it. Sort of, kind, of, kind of like earth bending, but with concrete. Yeah, actually, there's. Oh a... wait, it's the power to create concrete. I thought it was the power to turn people into concrite. No, it, oh, but like you a can minus touch. You can encase them in concrete, was. which is what's happened to his his tribe back. But home. then you have to wait for it to dry, right? Wait, no, his... it, it instantly dries. Wait, oh. his tribe? Uh, it's it's a video game. Just go with it. His tribe, yeah. He's he's, he's a uh, uh, first person's. I don't know which tribe. It's put me on the spot. street artist clan. Yeah. Group. Oh, it's a game. It's deeply Guild. racist. It's a game. Um, no, no, no. It's it's Native American. Uh, yeah, uh, okay. I think I've seen that. It's, it's Native American. Yeah. I'm, um, you can tell I'm not very familiar. Is with this it. set in like the 80s? <laughs> no, no. It's it's sort of modern time. Well, it's it's call, would, call it the near it, future. Yeah, it would, sounds like something that would come out of the 80s. It does. Yeah. Yeah. Aesthetically, it looks like alternate near future. Yeah, it's alternate near future. Yeah. Um, the near future is imagined in okay. the 80s. Yes. All of this was prelude to my actual point. <laughs> Sorry. Which is... <laughs> Don't touch women to get their concrete <laughs> powers. <laughs> no, that was not it. The actual no, point <laughs> is that during that last battle, I had to upgrade my abilities four times. And the aforementioned video game guy, who's this giant video demon, he's actually going and he's getting these, these big... Um, they're like power no nodule node things and he's throwing them down into the building for me so that I can touch them and get my power ups and do all this. It's just something you've done throughout the game. You know how to do it. So it works within the narrative. The problem is it was so meta. It was so uh, fourth wall breaking in that meta of I'm going to pause now and upgrade now and have this power by the end of the fight that it, it really showed me that even though I had beaten the game and done the, the main storyline, that what I was really doing was playing a video game. So that's the first thing. Then I pop back out, as a lot of these games do when you beat them, and they say, there's now so much more to do, mm. right? Go finish the, the side quests that you never did, because it's an open world game. So who, so who makes this? Because this sounds like a very Ubisoft sort of thing to do. Actually, it's Sucker Punch. Okay. But what... Uh, you know, they, they don't pick on them too much. Yeah. I mean, it's not it's not Sucker Punch's fault. Yeah. This is a this is a common design decision that's made. Um, you know, if you force someone to wait until they've done all the content to finish the mainline quest, they're not going to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the same time, if you deny them the ability to do the extra stuff they missed after the mainline quest, then that doesn't work too. Mm -hmm. But here's the problem: I'd already done everything in the game that you could possibly do, except finish the main mission. So when I pop back out with my cool new concrete powers, I couldn't use them. Mm. Even literally to the point where the way that you recharge concrete powers is by taking a downed enemy and pulling the energy off of them. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, for, for Neon, you pull it from Neon, from Smoke, you pull it from Smoke, and it, it all makes sense. Hmm. Why don't um, you pull it from concrete? Then? Well, because they'd been given concrete powers. Uh. Um, the bad guys had all the way through. You'd been fighting concrete powers. Oh, but that time. doesn't appear in the story. Uh, yeah, it does. It's all there. Well, later on in the story, like what you're saying is you can't draw power from the the, the, main quests. the enemies don't, don't I respawn. Is what I'm. That's that's what the I'm thing. Hearing. Once you clear an area yeah. and it's zero percent dupe controlled, mm -hmm. then there are no enemies. Uh. So if I had ever switched away from concrete at that point after beating the game, um, and and hundred percenting it, which are two completely different things, then I couldn't use it anymore. My point was this: I beat the game after I finished the game. Ooh. Hmm. That's like me with Skyrim. How so? I would do pretty much every side quest before actually doing the final mission where you, oh. where you meet the dragon and as right, the right, dragon right. lord. Dragon lord? Dragon yeah, you, uh, dragon, the dragon lord. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's a, uh, that's an awkward example, though, because with Skyrim, there's there's this um, mission generator, so there's always more content. Always, well, always, always, I, always I, more content. I consider that not more content. I consider that the same thing so you can get money to do things. Oh, well, okay. Also, with, I mean, with Skyrim, because I... And I'm sure I'm not alone in this. I never actually 
finish the I never beat the game, I guess you could say. Mm-hmm. So, I had a character where I did every single mission. Yeah. And For me, it, wow. so. I was I, I did finish Skyrim, and by that, and I'm going to use it maybe a little differently than you, Doc, but um, I finished Skyrim in the sense that I played a lot of hours. I felt I experienced enough of the game, and so I was finished. Well, you were it. done with it. Yeah. Yeah, but no, I you set it aside. This but is I, think, I think you that, abandoned I think it. when we're talking like, about... I'm 100% done with Skyrim. Right, right but I, I'm yeah. thinking when we're talking about a an open world game, right. like Infamous Second Son and like Skyrim, mm-hmm. well, let me that's, give you a, that's part of it. You can, or like a you Ubisoft can, game like uh, Assassin's Creed. Right. And you're right, it's very but you can beat yeah. you can beat the game itself in the sense that you can finish the final mission, but there's a lot more to do. GTA is a good example right. of this, mm-hmm. where yeah. there's a lot more to do in GTA even when yes. you beat it. Retirement Simulator. Right. And yes. so you can, yes. Yes. <laughs> and you can keep playing GTA and you may not be finished with the game, but when it comes to one hundred percent like in like in Skyrim, technically, even if you do everything in GTA, mm-hmm. you're even if you're quote one hundred percent, there's still more to do. So right. you may not be finished with GTA until you personally have decided I am finished with GTA. Plus exactly. GTA it has sandbox elements where Skyrim just has, you know, exploring the world and not really doing anything. Yeah. Well, a couple months ago I played Grow Home. And I talked about it. It was actually mm-hmm. a really cool little indie thing. Um, but there was this one side mission, side quest thing, where you could get these little um, crystals. And I got 99 out of the 100 that I, that were there. I even did a walkthrough video and went to every location they told me to go to, and I still couldn't find the last one. I had beaten the game hours and hours prior, but I couldn't find the last thing to get that 100%. So technically, I never finished It was inside of you all that along. game. Oh, that's sweet. Now I feel, now I feel <laughs> The complete. crystal was walking away from the game. Yeah, that's what it was. <laughs> Getting, um, going outside. Another <laughs> example, Mad Max, which I was playing recently. Um, I beat that game, and huge spoiler alert, um, at the end of it, you have one of your best friends in the... Oh, well, actually, quite pretty much everybody that you know dies, mm-hmm. um, including the car you've been using, because your whole quest was to get your car. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm characterizing the car in mm-hmm. order to say that it dies. It goes off my cliff. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> you beat it. You do the thing. You put you know the, the, the spear through the guy who you're trying to kill, Lord Scrotus, all that stuff. And then... Lord Scrotus. Ro- Lord Scrotus. Lord yes. Scrotus. Yes. Lord Scrotus. And then the credits roll, and then it says... Your quest is not finished. Now your car is back, uh, Chum Bucket is back, and everything is back so that you can find the secrets you did not get before. And it was so breaking, mm, so yeah. immersion breaking at that point that I'm like, you know what? I, I know I'm like 98% and there's a couple of pieces of scrap I missed or whatever. Mm. I don't care. Mm. I really, they I, should have given you, power off. They should have given you a quest to go find your car or go find Chum Bucket or whatever. Well, that's what the whole... Uh, no, Chum, I mean, Chum, Chum Bucket, Bucket died. Yeah, he died in a really ignoble way. Okay. So, uh, and the car... Chum Bucket didn't have a classy death? No, he did not. <laughs> <laughs> Shock, right? I'm shocked. And the car became, the, car became the big weapon to, to actually... Uh, Just fast metal gear? Yeah, it was, it was phase-wise. But anyway, it, does, it doesn't matter. Um, the, the so whole, it, it's totaled. Yeah, it, it completely totaled. Everything's totally totaled. Uh, off the side of a cliff, everything dies. You know, uh, it's horrible. You're There's mad no back. Back. It just mm. it just sucks. Now you're your dude with your car yeah. as it was at the beginning. Yes. And everybody else sacrifices everything that they have so that you can have your stupid car, mm-hmm. which is the whole point of the the game. And so, I loved the story that the way that it came out. Yeah. And man, am I feeling guilty for having spoiled that. I don't really care though because what I really want to rant about is the fact that after it's done. It's like, okay, now go back and, and do the, the metagame stuff. But for no. you, narratively, you felt, you know, you had closure at the end of the game. I did. So you were ready to move on. Until things rematerialized mm. and I was allowed to go back and in. Well, kind be- of an old, like an old classic solution to that is simply to put you to the point just before the end game. Yes. Ocarina of Time. Is yeah. 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 Yes. I know the, I believe, I believe the Batman games did that too, don't they? Mass right Effect does it. A lot of games do Most it. Of Fire Emblem Fire Fire Awakening yeah, did it. I mean, all sorts of games have this thing where it, like, it, it acknowledges that you beat the game as far as like, yeah, you've completed the game. And, and the Wit- but, Witcher 3 yeah. did the same thing when mm-hmm. I played it. And I, I loved the story of Witcher 3. I felt it completely deserved that. It won a bunch of awards for its story, best narrative and all and for the year that it came out. And I think it was was, was deserved. It had a great story. Mm-hmm. Um, when I beat the game, it did the same thing. It started me, you know, right outside. I think it was like right outside the throne room before you go back and you're prepared to... F- I'm not going to spoil anything, by the way, for this game because I actually care about people playing the game and mm-hmm. learning about it and experiencing it. I have fresh, Doc. 
No, I'm just <laughs> Why are you looking at me like yeah, that? Yeah, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm talking kidding. About. I give a spoiler alert. I know, I was kidding. It's no, totally okay to say anything ears. you want right. if you say spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> That's true. Um, no, but... but Spoiler alert, I gotta pee. <laughs> <laughs> no. no, but um, it's... Witcher, Witcher 3 had such a great ending from a, from a sense of closure that when it said, okay, now you can go back and you can finish off all the Witcher contracts that I had left to do, I still had more... Um, more levels that I could gain, more th- more skills that I could gain. So I, I was not, I hadn't necessarily um, finished the game from the sense of I had a lot more content that I could have experienced, but I didn't want to experience it because I felt my story was done um, and I was ready to move on. And I think that is kind of the flaw in a lot of these games that have these these giant open worlds. They mm-hmm. give you so much content, it can be intimidating. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, they try to give you a reason to continue playing, which is, of course, kind of that narrative pull. Mm-hmm. But at a certain point, once you finish that off, um, a lot of these games really don't give you much incentive to go back and play. And right. I think the, the one that I, that I would hold as the example of, hey, it really does give you a reason to go back, is Grand Theft Auto. And I think a big reason for that is that um, because it is this sandbox, you are able to go in and you can you can play in like ten minutes, ten minute chunks. So I got ten minutes here. I'm gonna pop in that auto five and see how long I can uh, mess with people and run people over in my car, or like run off a cliff and see how long it takes me before a cop comes and shoots me. Mm-hmm. You know, something like that. Where you just, um, I believe uh, Doc referred to it as snacking. Yeah, snacking right. and binging. Mm. Just having a good time playing a game for in a, in a short experience, almost like. Um, an old style arcade game where you'd go, you you say, okay, I'm, I'm going to play a game for a little while. You've got a few quarters. You stick in a quarter. You play for like, you know, maybe maybe you survive for five minutes and then you're done with the experience. Good connection. Move on. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's and on really that point, connection. actually, this brings me back a little bit to heat signature mm-hmm. and just procedurally get generated games in general. Mm-hmm. Is that those kinds of games that don't really have a long term goal but have a lot of really fun like moment to moment gameplay, yeah. like heat signature. You know, you could just hop on your computer, play ten minutes. You know, take over a couple of ships, get some, get into some space battles, etc. And that's kind of the idea behind roguelikes too, mm-hmm. where and and I, you could almost say that in a sense, um, that sort of style of play with GTA is 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 similar to a roguelike. I hadn't really thought of that before, but mm-hmm. I think it kind of is in the sense that. Um, you hop on whatever you're doing. You're not expecting to to keep anything. You're not expecting to keep whatever weapons that you gain. You're not expecting to keep any of the progress. You're you're going to die. You're going to lose a little bit of money, and you're going to lose all the weapons and all the equipment that you had. But it doesn't matter because you're just trying to see how far can I go and how much how much mayhem can I cause mm-hmm. versus how deep can I go in a dungeon. But I think there's a little bit of a connection there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can see that. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting, too, because you have uh, some games that try to incentivize you to keep playing by having some big, cool unlockable that you can, like, only get if you've done, like, 100% of everything or something like that. Right, like a, a, suit, but, a special suit of armor yeah. or like a sword or something. Now you're talking Ubisoft. The problem with that, though, is that <laughs> yeah. you get this thing, and then it's totally useless because you have nothing left to do. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, um, and so it really is just counting on you, like, sandboxing it, like you said, Jim. I think, though, this is a good time for us to move into, like, kind of the second phase of this discussion, though, which is talking about that concept of beating versus finishing. Yeah. Because we were talking a little bit before we uh, before we decided to go with this topic, and, you know, I mentioned that I kind of used the terms finish and beat a game interchangeably. Mm-hmm. Um, but do you want to tell us a little bit about kind of what your thought is on finish versus beat? Well, sure. Um, by beat, I mean specifically you have gone the mainline story quest which uh, causes the credits to roll and by finish I mean you have uh, cleared all of the areas you have um, sometimes it really means 100%ing the game other times the metric on that's a little strange Um, but basically done all the meaningful content within the game see that's kind of a I mean to me when I hear that because I honestly maybe it's just because I don't have the attention span I don't know but um, I'm tr- I'm struggling to think of a game that I could say honestly I finished by mm-hmm. that definition because I tend to not care enough to mm-hmm. 100% a game now unless it's a game that you 100% the game by beating the game mm-hmm. right like it's and you know some people some of our listeners I bet are are sitting there thinking you are only finishing the game mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, I'm go- I'm going for all the achieves mm-hmm. I'm going for a complete replay mm-hmm. of all possible. Branching. I remember elements. when I had the time for that. <laughs> yeah, it was called high school. Yeah. <laughs> that's the other thing too, and that's another point. I don't have a lot of time to play video games anyway, so I want to experience a lot of different games if I can. So I don't really feel that that urge to one hundred percent a game. So for me, when I hear finishing or when I think of when I'm finished with a game, I, I kind of go back to that 
um, I feel like I'm ready to put the game down and move on to something else. Right. And that's not always after I beat it. That's not, I mean, I still might go back and play more content and, and do more missions, but... Um, it's not necessarily when I 100 percent it either. Okay, so Skyrim is a good example of that. By yeah, way. well, yeah, yeah. As as an explorer game type, and I'm talking about the four player game types. You know, the uh, um, Bart the Simpson test. came up with it, yeah, right? Yeah, yes. Bart Simpson. Um, <laughs> Bartle. Oh yes, Bar- it was Bartle. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm thinking of you know myself as as a explorer, which I am. I go in, and I want to clear an area completely before I leave it. I'm one of those guys who wanders around in closed spaces, checks every single chest, checks everything. I'm not so mo- you like Minecraft and making sure you get every single ore from a cave. Yeah, actually, <laughs> I um, go into caves and just pick out the diamonds and leave. <laughs> <laughs> See, this makes sense. See, um, that's that's a smart way to play, right there. Just is take, it? take the good stuff and get the heck out. And then, if you need coal later on, you can go back. There you go. Well, well, Minecraft's a little bit different because it's so completely ergodic. You mm-hmm. can do whatever you want at any. You time. can never finish. Mm-hmm. Well. You can never right. beat Minecraft. Right. But what I'm talking about is, um, it, you know, when I'm playing um, Fallout 4 and I go into a, a specific area, I know I'm never coming back to that area. Yeah. So because of that, I want to make sure I found all the cool stuff. And, and that's the way that I play that. I'm not much for game guides to, hmm. you know, to and, look at it beforehand and go, I made to make sure I get the bobblehead who's in this area. If I miss that bobblehead, dude, it's on me because I am checking every crevice. I used to play... Um JRPGs that way when I was when I had time, mm-hmm. um, in the sense that For I would example. go in, I would go into a dungeon and I would intentionally try to pick the paths that I knew wouldn't take me to the boss, so that I could try to gain whatever treasure was in the room, or I could try to level up more mm-hmm. and try to intentionally try to get every single chest inside that dungeon mm-hmm. or that level or castle or whatever until I got to. Just as a reminder to the audience, what are the other three gamer types? There's, you, said, you said explorer. What are the other three? Uh, yeah, you've got the, I want to say it's the gunner. Uh, killer, I think it might kill, be. Killer, that's it. Yeah, mm-hmm. the, the, the killer, the socializer, mm-hmm. and the... Because that could definitely help define how you the, finish or beat or the jerk. play through games. Didn't have something to do with story or something like that? Yeah, that's what it is. The uh, the narrative mm-hmm. person. I forget what they called it. Yeah, the... but yeah, it's it's mainly talking about um, like, or it was rather adapted at some point to MMOs, and so some of the things don't really necessarily apply, but oh, you can okay. still kind of adapt some of the ideas. For instance, the socializer, if you're more interested in, say, an RPG, maybe interacting, it was maybe it might have been Quester. Um, but you know, say in an RPG where you get to have dialogue Achiever. options or conversations, was it you... Achiever? One of them, Doc. Achiever? That's Achiever. absolutely what it was. It was the yeah. Achiever. Yes. Um, but you can sort of have social elements, quote-unquote, by talking to NPCs and stuff like that. So if that's just kind of what interests you, as opposed to exploring for seeing all the sites or collecting all the things. Mm-hmm. Um, talking to to the all the NPCs in a JRPG, great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's repeat the same thing yeah. over and over and, again. And actually, to your point, Jim, like I was definitely the sort of player who, probably to a fault, <laughs> definitely to a fault in my experience, uh, tries to get through the dungeon as quickly as possible, to the point then where I get stuck at some place because I haven't been grinding enough, and I have to go back and grind for seven hours. But that's why I hate those. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, that's still the smart way to play for some of them, like because I know I, I played uh, the crap out of the original Final Fantasy on the on the NES. And that w- I would get into trouble for doing that, where I would I'd want to get all the chests on a floor, and in that game, that game's pretty hard, and you could very quickly get overwhelmed or run out of items or something. So mm-hmm. I would instead of just going for the boss and killing the boss when I was ready, I would try to get every chest, and I would I'd, I'd wipe. I would have party wipes for that. Mm-hmm. So it's it's dangerous in games yeah. to do that sometimes. And my motivation for wanting in, in open world games, wanting to clear the area before taking on the big boss in that area, is I want to be as tooled up as I possibly can mm-hmm. going in. Um, I'm not. Uh, I'm real big on going in, realizing I'm not powerful enough, and then backing out, right. leveling up, and then going back in with a different strategy. I, I, I don't want to do that. Uh, so for me, when I play Assassin's Creed or whenever I played uh, Mad Max or any of these types of games where you've got that internal mechanism for leveling up your character and choosing what what order you're you know, doing the sequence of the gameplay in for me it's it's never an an argument it's always i'm going to be as powerful as i can possibly be 
going in. This gets into kind of some interesting stuff with player ability versus character ability. Mm -hmm. And this is, I think, the other version of finish versus beat. Yeah. The one that we sort of alluded to at the beginning where you've got the idea of beating a game takes potentially more player skill than simply finishing a game. Right. So let's let's talk about that. Yeah, and that was something that I, that when I saw originally your topic when you sort of proposed it, um, I was thinking along the lines of this concept of designing a game for a challenge to try to give someone the ability to to beat it from a skill standpoint, which is what I thought you meant from beating a game, is right. that you're, you're conquering the challenges within the game versus um, the narrative aspect of the game is designed specifically to give you a sort of uh, narrative experience. The designer wants you to beat the game, so they're intentionally mm -hmm. setting things up for you to win, a.k.a. Um, auto saves, regular save points, and... Um, I don't want to say no challenge because obviously these games can have challenge, but they're going to present it in such a way that if you keep, um, you know, slamming your head against the game, regardless of what your skill level is, you're going to win because they're they're setting you up for success versus trying to challenge you to win. Right, it's, and that's that's kind of a more modern development in video yes, games. Yes, exactly. Because in, exactly. in the old NES days, you couldn't really have auto save points, so they had to design around that. And you had to kind of beat a level in one go through. Yeah, there could still be play styles, but that was more of a player ability thing than a character ability. Mm -hmm. Now you you have these even very linear games. Uh, one of my favorite is uh, Enslaved. I've talked about it in the yes. past. Mm -hmm. It still has RPG elements. You level up which thing you want to be. Do you want to play offensive? Do you want to play defensive? Do you want your lightning stick to explode when you hit robots, or do you want it to uh, deal double damage? I mean, you know, mm -hmm. you have these uh, choices within your own play style. And that's worked into the mechanics of, of a game now. So, yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. I think that's a completely valid definition of play to beat versus play to finish. And that's also the sort of thing where you can get to the point in a game, um, and this is why someone that is playing a game specifically because they want that challenge, might stop before they even get to the end of the game. Because if you feel like you've mastered the game systems already, it's almost like there's no point to continue. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I, I didn't so much beat and or finish Fallout 4 as I did abandon it. Mm. Um, and you know how much I was raving about that game and enjoying that game, and I still did all the way up until the end. Um, but I, I figured out what happened to my son, and I was like, cool. Narratively, I am done. I am, I'm good. I'm solid. There's lots of things I could do mechanically within the game. Um, and, and then first DLC has now come out, so I'm going to hop back in and I'll have a report on that for uh, you know a couple of weeks. But mm -hmm. and, and Fallout 4 definitely strikes me as a game, and I, I, I still have not played it because honestly I was kind of turned off. Totally different topic, mm -hmm. we talked about that before, but um, I've played New Vegas and I've played 3, mm -hmm. and of course I've played the originals. But 4 as well has this feeling of, just like 3 and New Vegas, it they want you to beat the game. There's a lot of content there. There's, I'm not saying there's not a lot of content. There's a mainline story. But there's a mainline story. They're expecting of every single player that picks up the game, they're expecting this person will finish our game unless they choose to quit before they finish the game. Mm -hmm. They are expecting you to beat the game. Whereas there are... there are The other types of game that I'm talking about, the challenge game, you need skill to beat the game. Yes. They're not necessarily designing the game for you to beat it. They're designing a game that is a challenge... And you can beat it if you're good enough. And yes. I What's wanted, an example of something like well, that? Well, pretty much every retro game. But I think yeah. an example that I, I kind of mentioned um, when I was coming up with some of the ideas for what to talk about, um, and this almost sounds like a counterexample at first, would be uh, Kirby's Dream Land. Mm. And the reason I bring it up is because the Kirby series is known for being very a very accessible action platformer, mm -hmm. which it is. But the way that the game is designed, it's still it's still designed from the standpoint of being a challenge. Is that the challenge is set low? You're expected to be able to beat it um, from the sense that the amount of skill that you need to beat a Kirby game is not that high. But they're also not designing the game so that um, if you're bad at the game, you will win. You can still lose at a Kirby game. Yeah, you can still totally lose if you if you suck Just at watch Kirby. Watch the Game Grumps, right? If you suck <laughs> at Kirby, you will lose. They're not constantly giving you all these like auto save points right before a boss. I mean, even something like Super Mario, where you know if you know what you're doing, you can get like practically infinite lives. Of yeah. course, it takes skill to get those infinite lives, but still, you know, you can die. I'm and, thinking Sonic there because you can right. just get infinite lives forever, and that won't have any effect on your mm -hmm. gameplay. Mm -hmm. And even something Good like, example. and I would say even something like. Um, newer Mario games, like, for example, uh, well, I guess it's not that new anymore, but Super Mario Galaxy, which I thought was an excellent game, as a game that, that 
there is a challenge there, and mm -hmm. each level does have a certain level of challenge. And, and arguably, you could say that, that the 3D Mario games are almost kind of doing both, because they're expecting you to beat... They're, they're, they're setting the challenge level to a certain point where just about anyone can, can defeat Bowser, mm -hmm. but there's so many extra levels and so many extra um, challenges. If you want to get all 150 stars or whatever it is. Precisely. Yeah. And, and it's, it's almost a sort of thing where when you play one of those games, you're not really, at least I'm not, I think a lot of people are the same way, um, you're not really trying to beat Bowser and save the princess or whoever. Um, you're really trying to, you know, beat the levels that are in the game, mm -hmm. and some of those levels that that you could maybe get to after Bowser, or are much more challenging than the final level. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there's you have a game kind of like the original Ninja Gaiden, mm -hmm. where you're just going through each level to get to the end, right? And there's no side challenges. There's nothing really outside of just going through the very linear progression. Of yeah, levels. finishing that game is beating that game, right? Yes. And and something like you know. Metroid to come back to a game that we talked about a lot last time, the original, but the original Metroid and also Super Metroid. These are games where you know there's there's a lot of areas to explore, but there's also, excuse me, there's also a very specific goal that you have in mind. But if you want to beat this game, you have to actually have um, the skill, and part of the skill in those games is not just um, the controls and the gameplay aspects of it. It's also being able to explore the environment, being able to um, remember and find your way around your uh, your surroundings, being very having a, having a, a good sense of exploration and finding all the power ups, things like that. So it's a just because I, I'm talking about skill and and challenge doesn't necessarily mean I'm talking about Twitch ability. Mm -hmm. That's a really great term uh, because you know the the Twitch games. Like Ninja Gaiden, I'm like Ninja Gaiden. I'm not a fan of <laughs> yeah. personally. Yeah, yeah. I, I just, I that's not my thing. Yeah, and there's, I, I think there's a lot like, of respect for people who can play that way. But. I think there's kind of like a subculture now that's emerged of people who are, especially for Twitch type gameplay, but just in general, they have like they want to just take on like the craziest challenge they can, and we see examples of this in uh, Super Mario Maker. Yeah. Oh yeah, yes. where. Which is a really fun experience, really fun game, by the way. Um, a lot of things you absolutely. can do. With it. Yeah. But you have people who come up with just like the craziest massacre levels, and we were talking about this earlier, Doc, yeah. where you know you have these like streams of like you know the makers of a level creating something and then trying to beat it because in order to upload a level for people to play, you have to clear it to prove that it is beatable. Um, and so, you know, you have the creator of the level who's having a hard time beating his and own level. I always, <laughs> I always include. I, I update. I, I, I'm kind of a jerk, so I've updated. I've made levels that are pretty much like extremely crazy hard to beat, mm -hmm. and then in order to get it uploaded, I'll I'll create like some sort of like hidden block, oh, some yeah. sort of hidden trick to <laughs> yeah. let me like teleport to the end, basically. Right. But there's no indication of where it is. That, that's something that uh, Ross from Game Grumps used to do. Yeah, it's yeah. such. It's yeah. such. A, I, I didn't even know anyone else did it. I thought I. I I'm gonna just assume I came up with it and he stole it from me. There you go. I mean, those part levels are literally <laughs> impossible to beat um, uh, using conventional methods. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and. Technically, you could. I, I never go quite that far because I think that's a little bit of a jerk move. Mm -hmm. But it, I still make it because I mean, you could easily do that. You could make it so that there's like an unjumpable gap, and then you literally can't beat it no yeah. matter what, yeah. unless you find the hidden trick, mm -hmm. which you have to find by just jumping like every pixel until you find it. I would never do that, yeah. but I did make really difficult areas where you have to jump on all these, you know, use little enemies and jump across them and fight all the different Bowsers and bosses mm -hmm. and all this just mm -hmm. to get through. But you're right; it's an interesting experience mm -hmm. when you have these. Um, these levels that are made specifically to be extremely difficult. Yeah, and you know, I, I was I saw this video recently of this guy who was streaming the making of his level, and he was trying to beat it, and you know, freaking out when he finally did beat his own level. Um, but the other thing that was interesting, Doc, that you pointed out is that he's just kind of chatting over it. Yeah, and uh, what this says to me is that one, he's been doing it for a very long time, uh -huh. and the sort of complexity that's happening, like mm -hmm. you know, the the sort of timing and reflexes it takes, it's become muscle memory. Muscle memory. And now for me, which is not fun. Yeah, that that is not fun to me. It's because I think that, you know, we've talked a little bit about before about flow theory, where you're trying to have enough challenge to keep things interesting, but not so much that you become frustrated. And there are so many games out there that are trying to be like just challenging for challenge's sake that they, I think, lose the fun because it's almost more of a performance, more of like this memorized dance that you're performing to get through the level. And to me, I don't see the appeal in that. Now, I know really? how some people might think it's interesting because like they're they're slowly learning it and they're mastering it and they've conquered this really impossible thing that nobody else can do. But at that point, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I personally lose interest well before I get to that point. To, to me, challenge in a game should be about learning skills that the game is teaching you and applying those to new challenges that you haven't uh, faced before in the game. As and opposed to level memorization. Exactly. 
Because that's so, kind of where I was going with it. Because yeah. I, I, in a game, I want to... It's, it's it's an interactive medium, so I want to interact with the world. I want to respond mm-hmm. to what the game is throwing at me mm-hmm. using skills that I've accumulated over time playing the mm-hmm. game. And I and I I think it's I actually kind of enjoy, or at least I did, games where you had to memorize the level in order to win. Mm-hmm. A lot of a lot of shoot 'em ups are like that. Running mm-hmm. on games are like that. Where um, in order to get through, or like something like say um, you know Ghosts and Goblins, or again Ninja game Gaiden. like that. A, a lot, yeah, or Ninja Gaiden. A lot of these old style arcade games. Or, or, or arcade games, I yeah. should say, um, are designed in such a way that the challenges are pretty much impossible with tw- even with tw- really high twitch reflexes to prepare for. You have mm-hmm. to kind of know it's coming mm-hmm. so that you can dodge out of the way and you can be in the right spot so that you don't you don't just hit the wall or something because you know a lot of these games have automatic scrolling too. It's a big part of it too. So you kind of you don't really have enough time to react. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there is there is an interesting. Ex- like cha- there is challenge there, and there also is um, something to be said for uh, the feeling of accomplishment you get for beating these sort of games. Right. Mm-hmm. And there is that flow state. And I do think even with uh, with those games I have gone back and played, um, and interestingly, I will still remember all of the same areas, which I find very odd. But a <laughs> game that I, you know, hadn't played since uh, I, you know, I was like eight years old. Mm-hmm. But I'll pick it up oh. and I'll I'll play like an old. But I played so many times, I, I memorized yeah. everything. So yeah. I'm it's I like totally can still play it through. <laughs> Uh, which is a very interesting experience, very fun um, still to me to this day. So I do think there there is something there. I know I'm rambling because I've got I, I way think, too much coffee. Yeah, but. <laughs> I think the, I'm just kind of like at a point in my life, and we've talked a little bit about this before, even with the aging of audiences, um, where I might have enjoyed something more like that when I was a kid, and we talked about this when we did our retro talk, and I think you guys even talked about this when you were talking about snacking and binging, um, of there's an appeal to that when you're younger and you have the time but then as you get older and like I don't have that sort of time for gaming anymore, that sort of game would frustrate me because I just don't have the time to dedicate to playing something over and over again to get through it. Also, also as a kid, you don't have any other options. Mm. You know, if I was a kid in the 80s, which I wasn't, mm. but if I was a kid in the 80s and Ninja Gaiden was my only game and I, yeah, didn't, you I, have, didn't, I didn't have a day job to right. go buy something good like right. Legend of Zelda. You, you have this one game yeah. and you're going to play the hell out of it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, there was no Facebook either. Yeah. So. Yeah. Whereas now I can go on Humble Bundle and pay $12 for basically a thousand hours of entertainment that I'll never get to. Mm. Exactly. <laughs> I have so many games in my Steam library that I'm never going to play. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we have options now. And that might be part of the reason, too, that we have, unless like it's kind of like a niche sort of you know subculture that embraces games like that, um, there probably is a movement more toward maybe veering toward too easy versus too hard if you want people to be attracted to your game, or at least to finish your game. I think it's, and this is, I think we're, we're approaching a different topic, but I do think that that is in part because developers are trying to bring in new audiences Mm -hmm. and they're trying to make uh, games more mainstream, which I think they have become more mainstream. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that kind of um, is is trying to pull in an audience that maybe is more interested in um, movies. Mm -hmm. They they want to have a complete experience. Right, right. Yeah. And people that I would say that are playing games that are not gamers. Uh oh! I called someone playing a game, not a gamer. Oh no! Okay, <laughs> let's put a pin in that one. Definitely. Yeah. Well, I think uh, on that note, it's actually probably a pretty good time to start winding things down. So, anyone have any uh, final thoughts on finishing versus beating games, completionism, anything related to that? Well, I, I think that this is an important thing to understand when you're designing a game. Mm. Is what do you expect the end of your game to be for the player? Mm-hmm. And I think so many games have a really strong beginning. Yeah. Narratively, they might even have a really strong ending. And the really good ones have good stuff in the middle that helps you, rem- you know, remind you who the bad guy is, why you're chasing him, that sort of a thing. Uh, but I think the danger is whenever we have something like Mad Max where it's repeated elements, variants on a theme over and over and over and over again, gamers who aren't explorers aren't going to get into that. They're not going to be interested in it. They're not going to want to 100% it like like I do. And I, I think building off of that too, you kind of have to also want to know what your what your play what you want your player to feel at the end of the game. Yeah. Like do you want them to feel like they've accomplished something and that they were they were greatly challenged and they're very frustrated but then they're able to win at the very end? Or do you want them to have some sort of like emotional response? Is are you telling some sort of story that you want them to feel attached to, mm-hmm. attached to a character, and then feel like, oh no, this character died, or he didn't accomplish what he was going to, or oh he did, and that's really cool, and I feel great that I was a part of his journey. So um, that's another part of that that consideration that yeah. I think designers need to take into account. 
Another point, um, and this is kind of a separate topic, so this is something in which we will have to uh, stick a pin, mm. but um, what kind of games have good replay value as mm. opposed to just continuing off of what you've already done with a single playthrough? Mm. So true. Right. New Game Plus and that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, well, well not, not even not New even Game Plus. plus. Mm. Yeah, you're talking about I've, completely restart. I've had yeah. multiple characters with Skyrim, even though I've 100%ed with one mm. of them, mm. and that was a completely different experience. Mm. I've never finished Skyrim, but I've played with, through, with multiple characters. Not all the way through, but... Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what 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 other kind of games have uh, replay value where you actually want to start over instead of just finish and be done? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Good point. Chris, you're the only one that didn't say a final thought. Final thought. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'll just mention quickly, I guess, that uh, a while back when we were still writing articles in backward dash compatible dot com, um, <laughs> I wrote a uh, I wrote a quick thought about um, completionism, um, or actually more specifically perfectionism as a motivation to replay games. And um, I actually distinguished it from completionism in that I thought of completionism as tr- like trying to see all the branches or trying to get every item or every power up or every achievement, whatever. Perfectionism was something where I wanted to replay something to do it better or do it right, quote unquote, the second time through. Um, an example that I used is when uh, in Fire Emblem Awakening. Where after I'd beaten the game, I sort of let it play out organically, and if I lost anyone to permadeath, I just let that be you know organic and emergent. Uh, but the second time through, I wanted to make sure that nobody died. I didn't go to casual mode because that's not enough of a challenge. I wanted to like have to restart the level if someone died, but I wanted to have like a no death run, and I was very much more intentional this time about um, having uh, you know certain parents match up to get the right unit and like you know creating units and that sort of stuff. Um, and so even though creating units and that sort of stuff, yes, (laughs) the birds and the bees and Mm -hmm. eugenics and all that sort of fun stuff. Were you, your characters touching so you can get concrete powers? (laughs) Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, and so a concrete mage type. Yeah. (laughs) Um, but I named her concrete shop. Uh, but that is, I guess it does play in a little bit to the, uh, the replay value thing that you're talking about, Nick, because Mm -hmm. I wanted to achieve a certain end the second time through. Yeah. Even though a lot of stuff that I did was basically the same same thing the second time through. I wasn't going for more, I was going for better. Um, Another thing with replay value is once you've done something in a game and you want to replay it to optimize mm-hmm. your outcome, mm-hmm. because the first time you kind of just like go through organically, not right. really knowing what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like watching a movie the second time, knowing the plot twist mm-hmm. and seeing all of the foreshadowing right. going into it. Play- and, it playing... becomes, and it becomes a different experience, mm-hmm. but we'll yeah. have to, I think we'll have to definitely stick a pen in that. Yeah, for sure. We're, we're running a little short on time, but yep. thank you all for joining us for episode number 62 of the backwardcompatible.com podcast. Oh, 62. Well, I'm Jim. I'm Chris. I'm Doc. And I'm Nick. And we'll see you next time. We want to join your discussion because dialogue makes everyone better. Want to hear our thoughts on a particular game or topic? Get in touch with us on Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, YouTube, or at our website, backward-compatible.com. And we might feature your question on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible.